Good morning, everyone, and Merry Christmas to you all. Good to see so many of you here today. You never know on the Sunday after Christmas. I'm reminded of a story uh, comes from my time in a little church up in Solon about a preacher who, uh, much like I was at the time, just out of seminary, and it was the Sunday after Christmas. And uh, he got into the church and up in the pulp and he looked out and there was just one person there. And so he decided, well, I'm going to go down and I'm going to speak to this you know, one person and see if they'd like to have a service or not. I mean, after all, it's just one person. So he went down and he spoke to the man and he happened to be an old farmer. A lot of farmers in Solon, Maine. And um, maybe you've heard this. <laughs> And he spoke to him and he said, uh, you know, it's just the two of us here, do we really want to have a service today? Well, the farmer spoke up and he said, you know, when I feed my cows, if I go out into the field and there's just one cow out there, I still feed them. So, the preacher said, all right. So he went up in the pulpit and boy, he preached a sermon. Long sermon. Gave him the full the full load. So after the service, he went down and said, well, how was that? Are you happy with that? And he said, well, he says, you know, when I go out and feed the cows, if there's just one, I don't give them the whole bale, all the bales in my truck. So I won't give you all the bales today from, from the pulpit today. <laughs> Merry Christmas to all of you. It's good to be with you all here. Uh, before we begin, are there any announcements? Anything that needs to be mentioned this morning? If not... Would you join me now in our call to worship this morning, which is taken from Psalm 148. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise the Lord in the heights. Praise the Lord, sun and moon, praise the Lord, all shining stars. Let them praise the name of the Lord who commanded and they were created. Praise the Lord. May we stand and sing together hymn 130 in the Pilgrim Hymn Note this morning. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Thank you. 
I'm going to do something a little bit different today. Would you turn with me in your New Century hymnal, that's right there in your pews, to page one for our invocation this morning. Page one. I'll give you a couple minutes. And we're going to responsibly read together the sentences of adoration, which are our opening prayer today. Page one in the New Century Hymnal. Looks like we have it. Let's begin. Let's pray together. Our help is in the name of the Holy One who made heaven and earth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God has brought the people of the covenant from the land of bondage into freedom. Jesus came to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim lease to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of God's favor. Amen. Please be seated. We are in the season of giving, but of course the scriptures relate to us that really every day should be a part of the season of giving. Giving and sharing of ourselves, of our resources, of our talents, and of our time. So as we gather here today, we, we endeavor to do the same. As John wrote, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and he who is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In that spirit, may we have this morning's offering.
this beautiful day, Lord, this day in which we remember and reflect upon the very birth of our Savior. We remember how he gave of himself in so many different ways as his life uh, continued from his birth. We ask today, God, that as we continue on, that we would always be ready to give and to share of ourselves. So we would ask humbly, God, that you would bless these offerings, that your hand would pass over them, and that they might be multiplied all and through the very presence of Jesus Christ, whose name we celebrate today. Amen. Good morning. The scripture readings for this morning are from the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 18 through 26. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. His mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord repay you with children by this woman for the gift that she made to the Lord. And then they would return to their homes. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow in both stature and favor with the Lord and with the people. The New Testament reading is from Colossians Colossians, chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, lowliness, meekness, and patience, forbearing one another, and if one has a complaint against the other, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must begin to forgive. And above all, these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That concludes this morning's readings from the Revised Standard Version. Our gospel reading this morning is taken from the gospel according to Luke, the second chapter, and I'll be reading verses 41 through 52. Now every year his parents, that are Jesus' parents, went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and their friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the, tent, the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand what he had said to them. 
Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. May God add God's blessing upon the hearing and the reading of these words. Now, sadly, we don't have any children today, uh, so we won't have children's time, but I was thinking, and this is a, a note that I want to pass on to all of you, next Christmas Eve, I need to have children's time. We had a, a flock of children here, and, and they were busy, and they were looking for Santa, and they were looking for stuff, and, and so next Christmas Eve, mark my words, we'll be having a Christmas, Christmas Eve children's time. But for now, let us sing together. Please remain seated. Hymn number 137 in the Pilgrim Hymnal, Away in a Manger. we pray together. We thank you for the light of this day, the light that reminds us of the great light, which is our Savior Jesus Christ, whose birth we continue to celebrate and whose name we lift up today. Lord, in our world that we live in that is so filled with, with things that are bothersome or troublesome to our hearts, remind us of your birth each day and of the hope that it provides. For we ask this in your name. Amen. I don't know, I think most of you who are here today that I see attended the service on, on Christmas Eve. And I was just thinking how, how beautiful it was here. Not just because of the, the lights which we see, which is obviously very beautiful in this beautiful church, but all the beautiful people. You know, all of us celebrating together and coming together in peace and singing the wonderful, the wonderful carols that are so unique to this time of year. It's such a, it is such a beautiful time of year. But you know, there's another side to this whole story that we celebrate. There's another very important piece to this whole story, this whole piece of our faith that needs to be mentioned as well. You know, it's very interesting in reading of the birth of Christ there's a sense of peacefulness in this serene scene filled with angels and shepherds and, of course, wise men, the magi. And then there's this beautiful star, and then we sing Silent Night. But it's interesting to note that the story concludes with anything but serenity. After the so-called wise men or magi departed, that is a part of Matthew's version of the Christmas story, Matthew tells us of a dream of Joseph's in which he was told to take the newborn baby, Jesus, 
and Mary and to flee for their lives. Not just to leave, but to flee, to get out of there, where they are. To flee literally for their lives. And why? Because there was this king, King Herod, during whose reign the Christ child was born, and he was seeking to destroy this newborn king because he saw this newborn king that the Magi had told him about as a threat to him. Now, King Herod was really kind of a nasty character by all accounts. During his reign, the Christ child was born, and he did seek to kill him, but he was not above killing or doing almost anything. He was known for his cruelty throughout antiquity. And so what did Herod do? Because he couldn't pinpoint who this Jesus was, he decided, well, I'm going to kill all of the children. Isn't that awful to think about? He was going to kill all of the children that were you know, approximately Jesus' age, or maybe not, we don't know for sure. And the hope was that if he killed all the children, that he would kill the infant Jesus, who was to be this new ruler that he had heard about through the Magi. It's just a horrible thing to think about. The story of our Lord's birth that is mingled with bright lights and soft choruses of carols is in reality a story of a great birth amongst great avarice and violence. And looking at the complete story, we view a child representing hope and peace and all the things that we long for to be a part of our lives, who is brought into a world posed to extinguish that hope. Jesus the Christ was sent into a world that had no room for his birth and that would eventually echo with cries of innocent children being murdered. A world that, to some extent, right from the beginning, desired Christ's death from his birth until his eventual crucifixion. This is also a part of this story that we can't just pass over and forget about. In speculation upon this, we may feel compelled to kind of push that stuff aside. Say, well, I don't want to talk about that, Pastor. That's awful stuff. That's terrible. We want to think about the beauty and the humble nature of the nativity, which is certainly so important as a part of our faith journey this time of year as well. But in doing so, if we we neglect this other piece, this other kind of nastiness that Jesus was born into, this, this sense of violence, I think we may risk losing sight of the true defining moment that occurred when we celebrate Christmas and what we celebrate at Christmas. And I want you to think about this with me as well. For it is not in the beauty, the pageantry, or even the holiness that we discover the true meaning of Christ's birth. Perhaps to our disappointment, we find Christ born as a part of ugliness, as we have defined it in a barn, amongst animals, in a community of poor, in a society that tolerated injustice, in a nation ruled by violent and murderous persons, seemingly this child had no chance to survive. Virtually none, let alone grow up to be the savior of a people. And yet, he did. And yet, Jesus did. And it is here that we find I think the real reason to rejoice, the real reason to celebrate, the reason to recall that birth, for it is in the utter despair and the sadness and the ugliness, if you will, of life that Christ's light shines the brightest, the very brightest. And it is out of Christmas that we once more face all of these same realities that make our Lord's present so important and so necessary to all of us. You know the other... Week. Last week I was doing some Christmas shopping. <clears throat> I'm sure many of you were doing the same thing. And I was in a particular store, a lot of people. Oh my gosh, people everywhere. And literally, in the midst of all this hubbub and people grabbing and pulling for stuff, you know, you know, there I was trying to keep my shoulders in, wearing my mask, hoping I wouldn't get sick or punched or kicked or something. A fight broke out between two men in this store. I'm not sure what it was about, but they were really angry. And I thought, oh Lord, 
Help us now. You know, help me now. <laughs> what am I going to do? And there was all this hubbub and stuff. And then this miracle happened. And it was a miracle. This woman came around the corner with a wagon. And in the wagon was a little baby. Little child. And she came around the corner with this little child. And all this stuff was going on. And these two guys were going at it. And suddenly, one by one, the people who were involved in all this hubbub, they just stopped. They saw this baby. They just stopped and they looked at this little child. And even the two guys that were ready to duke it out, they just stopped. And they all started looking at this little child. And they kind of blinked and stopped. And the next thing you knew, there were bunches of people walking over to see this little child and ooing and eyeing saying, what a beautiful child. It stopped everything. It stopped the commotion. It stopped the violence. It stopped it all. And eventually people kind of shook hands, more or less, and said they were sorry for the, the problems they had caused. And even I eventually got close enough to take a look at this beautiful child. And oh, it was a beautiful baby. And it had suddenly appeared amongst all this mayhem and this crazy making, amongst people who were angry and exhausted and perplexed, and it brought peace. I thought, what a message. In the midst of all of the ugliness, there was beauty in this child. Isaiah the prophet wrote of the coming Messiah that it would be his presence that saved his people. That the Messiah would lift up his people and carry them in much the same way that a caring and nurturing parent holds fast to a, to a child. And when we look back at our Lord's turbulent life, and it was a turbulent life, at least as much as we know of it, we should recognize that the ugliness that surrounded him from birth to death surrounds us as well. I'm sure you've all noticed it. And this is the other piece for us as Christians. We should not turn away from it or ignore the hate or the degradation of humanity or the injustice and pain that surrounded our Lord and also surrounds us as well. Because as beautiful as our world is and as numerous as are the blessings of God, there is still this ugliness and we are to be a part of it and to make a difference. To be the ones that show peace and hope in the midst of this ugliness. In the midst of the hopelessness that may surround people, we're to offer hope. You and I, not just me. We are all a part of this together. That's what Christianity is about. That we work together to bring about a sense of hope in the midst of the ugliness. You know, some people are still vengeful and mean-spirited and hard-hearted and crueling and willing to hurt others. And we're supposed to do the opposite, all of us. To be the opposite side, to, to show what the difference a life in Christ can make to the world. And we're the examples of that. And you know, as Christians, we're not exempt from all of this stuff. We become a part of it very easily. We are a part of the suffering of humanity. And this is the facts. We can't escape it. Jesus looked out at one point and he said, the poor will always be among us. This was Jesus saying this. And I think he meant the poor in spirit as well as poor in resources. But perhaps most important of all, as Christ followers, we are meant to be right in the center of it. You know, that's one of the reasons that I, I really was attracted to this church community. This great big church, this big beautiful church, right in the middle of all kinds of stuff right here in Augusta. You know, down below there's a homeless shelter. There's homelessness all around us. People begging for money. Just down the street here, up the street. And where are we as a church? Right in the middle of it. That's where we're supposed to be. You know, there's a church up in Farmington, up in my neck of the woods. And it's a beautiful church full of wonderful people, I'm sure. But they decided they were going to build a new church because they didn't like where it was located, right in the middle of town. So they pulled way out of town, way out in the country, and they built this big, beautiful church. 
And every time I pass it, I think, what a beautiful church. It looks so nice, but it's in the wrong place. It's out in the middle of a field now with, with uh, solar panels all around it. When in fact, people should be around it. People who are in need. People who are suffering. That's where we're supposed to be. That's where we're all supposed to be. We are meant to participate in it. In the ugliness. As Christ follows, we are poised to commit ourselves to it. We are supposed to be in the middle of it. You know, Jesus was not ashamed to call those who followed him brothers and sisters, saying, here am I and the children whom God has given. We are one in Christ. Since therefore the children share flesh and blood, the scriptures tell us, he himself likewise shared the same things, for it is clear that he did not come to help angels, but the descendants of Abraham. Christ came to be a part of our everyday lives so that he could take part in our sufferings, in our hardships, and even in our ugliness. And we are to continue that work, you and I. We look towards a new year. This is our last time gathering as a church this year. And this is something we need to look forward to to the next year. To continue the work Jesus started long ago, even at his birth. We are to place ourselves in the middle, in the very center, if we can, of the wrongs of this world and do our very best with God's help to make them right. We are to be in the middle of fear, bringing hope. We as Christ's followers are to shine the light of decency into the darkness of violence, cruelty, negligence, and poverty. In Christ's name, we are to make a difference in the lives of people who know hardship and pain. And you know, I'm very proud to say that this church does an awfully lot of that. And we're going to continue to do a lot of it. We are called by our Lord to confront the ugly and to make a difference in Christ's name as his followers, as his people, as his church. Long ago, as we have been celebrating now, really, for a few weeks, Christ was born amidst a backdrop of a star and on a beautiful silent night. But these things, as real as they were, were only a backdrop, even as they are now. Death was really close behind Jesus then and then throughout his whole life. The world was as cruel and as ugly as it is now, and that's exactly why he came. To turn the bad to good, to right the wrongs, to help us to see the light through the darkness, to lead us from spiritual death to life. As the scriptures relate, and he became their savior in all of their distress. So I hope along with me and those who are part of this church community, all of us together, that we might continue this work with our Lord's guidance and strength. And let us walk, even in the midst of the ugliness, with confidence and all that might challenge us as the days go ahead, as the year comes upon us, knowing in our faith that God is with us. Praise God. Amen. As we come to a time of prayer, I just want to mention that I unfortunately might not have gotten some of the prayer requests in this week's bulletin. We were trying to get two done. And again, I want to thank Donna so much for stepping up and helping me this past week and the last couple of weeks with the bulletin and the work here at the church. She's She's been kind of a savior for me, and I want to say thank you to her. Um, so we were working hard. We might have, I might have missed some, some prayer requests. So if there's something that's not in the bulletin that you want there for a prayer request, please remind me of it today. Um, I would just like to mention as a part of our prayer time that I want to pray today for, for a young lady who's, a, who's going through a very difficult time. Her name is Taylor. And I would like to also have prayers for my Aunt Cynthia, who is uh, struggling with dementia. And so for those two folks, I would like to add their names to the prayer list and just ask if there are other prayers today. Yes, Elizabeth. Oh, okay. So Elizabeth, you and your dad are going to Florida. As they say, we, we pray for traveling mercies for you.
Okay, any others this morning? Yes, Sue. Okay, say again, I'm sorry. Bernard Perry. Okay, how is he doing? Okay, so the prayers are for Bernard Perry, who was lost, suffered frostbite, he suffers from dementia, and uh, they did find him, and he's hospitalized, but uh, he's, what, I think in his 80s, and he's not doing very well, so we lift him up in prayer today. Any others this morning? If not, let us come together in a few moments of silence as we consider what we have shared in today and shared in God's presence, and let us pray together. God of Christmas, God of the new year, God of hope, God of peace, God who sees the rights and, and works through people to make things better, God who observes the things that are wrong and whose very spirit teaches us how to make things right. We ask today, God, that as we come into your presence, as we celebrate the very birth of our Savior and the joy of this time of year, that we remember the lessons that come from our Savior's birth. That in the midst of the, the beauty of this season, there is a sense of ugliness as well a sense of the way that the world in truth is, filled with tragedy and loss, filled with hurt and anger. In short, Lord, it is a world in need of a savior, and that is what we celebrate today and should celebrate every day. We look to you during this time of year, Lord, as we remember the needs of people, and they are so many and so varied. We celebrate the joy of this season and the goodness of people's hearts that, that step out of the darkness and try to make a difference. But we also remember that the darkness exists, and there is a lot of darkness, and there is a lot of work to be done for each of us if we are willing to do so. So Lord, first and foremost, we give thanks for the birth of our Savior today. Give thanks for the hope that he offers us. And we would also pray, Lord, that your spirit, that very same spirit of hope, would come to inhabit each of us and that in turn attempt as best as we can to walk in the very footsteps of our Savior amidst the ugliness, amidst the darkness, offering light, and offering hope. We do pray for all of those on our prayer list, those who we have named as well as those that remain unnamed in each person's heart. We continue to pray for the family and friends of Carrie McKenzie. Her presence is sorely, sorely missed. We pray today for the Kumla family as Edie continues her recovery. We continue to pray for the Mills family. We pray for the homeless. And in the midst of all of this, we give praise for this vaccine that has made such a difference in many people's lives. And we would pray that others would come to that point in their life where they would, would also have this vaccine in their lives and that they would find the confidence to do so. We pray for Clarence and Marjorie. We pray for Mavis. We pray for Edward 
and we do pray for the tragedy of drug overdoses and for addictions. And in that same way, Lord, I pray today, we pray today for Taylor. And we ask God that you would help her and guide her out of the darkness that she is in. We pray for the Afghanistan refugees and for that whole situation, Lord, as they come into this community, we would ask God that we would find right resources to help them and that you would help us in this endeavor. And we pray for Americans who might not have been able to leave, to leave there. We hope, God, that they are all home and safe with their families this time of year. We pray for Elizabeth and for her dad as they plan to go to Florida to visit a loved one. We pray for that you would go with them on that journey. And we pray for Bernard Perry, Lord, this man who has suffered. We ask, God, that you would relieve some of that suffering and help those who are trying to help him. We pray for his wellness in both spirit and body today. As we continue into this new year that is upon us very soon, Lord, we pray that as a church that we would commit ourselves not only to this church, but to others outside of this church, for all those who seek and cannot find, for those who have lost hope and those who are living in anything but peace. Lord, may we in some way, as a part of your community, your body, your church, be able to reach out and make a difference in their lives through the very power of your spirit, what leads us onward, even the darkness, even the most difficult of times, you are there. We remember now the prayer that you taught us saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not let us fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May we close today's service in standing and singing together hymn number 122 in the Pilgrim Hymnal, God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen.
as we leave here today. Let us go in the joy of our Lord, knowing that each of our lives, each of our personhoods, each of our spirits can make a difference in this world. That's the joy of this season, that Christ goes with us. So go in that peace and go in that knowledge. Amen.